Good evening and welcome to our first Young Center event for the 2021-2022 school year here at the Young Center for Anabaptist and Pietist Studies at Elizabethtown College. I'm Steve Nolt, Interim Director of the Young Center, and so glad that each of you could be with us this evening for this event, both here in Booker Meeting House, those of you who I'm seeing in person, and uh, many folks joining us online across the country this evening. With support from Elizabethtown College, the Young Center fosters and promotes the study of Anabaptist and Pietist groups in their varied expressions across time and place. And in that vein, this evening, we're delighted to host Dr. Felipe Hinojosa of Texas A&M University for his presentation entitled, Quiet Riots, Latino Mennonites and the Politics of Belonging. His talk is based on his 2014 book, Latino Mennonites, Civil Rights, Faith, and Evangelical Culture, which was published in the Young Center book series through the Johns Hopkins University Press. And it's a great book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Dr. Hinojosa is an associate professor of history at Texas A&M at College Station, and also serves as the director of the Carlos Cantu Hispanic Education and Opportunity Endowment there at Texas A&M. And he's the editor of the peer-reviewed online forum, Latinx Talk. His work has appeared in journals such as the Western Historical Quarterly, American Catholic Studies, Mennonite Quarterly Review, and he also has a more recent um, book, uh, published just last winter through the University of Texas Press, entitled Apostles of Change, Latino Radical Politics, Church Occupation, and the Fight to Save the Barrio. Before we hear from uh, Dr. Hinojosa, I want to let our live stream audience know that they can uh, submit questions via the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, but the Q&A feature. And uh, at, uh, this evening after the presentation, uh, we will be presenting those uh, questions to Dr. Hinoza as well. So those of you who are here in person, be ready with uh, your questions, but those who are listening uh, via the live stream can enter your questions through the Q&A feature. Um, to welcome uh, Dr. Hinojosa. Thank you, Steve. So thank you, everybody. It's so good to be in person in a place uh, and to see people here. Uh, I'm so uh, honored to be here at the Young Center um, when uh, I was working with uh, the editors uh, here at the Young Center and at uh, Johns Hopkins University Press. There's a process of not only falling in love with the topic, but also falling in love with the process of making and creating a book. And so this I, it's the first time I'm here uh, in uh, in Pennsylvania and so the, in the Northeast and at the Young Center. And so to be here and to see where all of these conversations and emails were coming out of as I was putting this this first book together uh, means a great deal. So I want to thank Steve Nolt uh, and Kay Wolf and everyone here at the Young Center in particular for organizing this event uh, as a kickoff to uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, this month. And I'm sure that there are a lot of events uh, here at, uh, at, at Elizabethtown College as you all celebrate uh, a group that is and has been radically transforming uh, the United States for quite some time now, uh, demographically and uh, politically. All you have to do is follow the election cycles every time. And we are, uh, you know, to use that sort of uh, old and tired metaphor, perhaps the sleeping giant, right, uh, of voters uh, that are out there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the book project and um, you know, what we mean exactly by the politics of belonging as I go through this and all of that. Uh, and I've got some great photos, uh, some that uh, didn't necessarily make it into uh, the book uh, that I want to share with you all as well. Um, and then sort of think about a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, how we can begin to have a, a much more robust conversation about Latino religious politics, especially during the civil rights era and what it might mean to sort of incorporate and think more critically uh, about Latino studies uh, in the United States. I am a child of the border. I was born and raised in deep South Texas. And one of the things that I quickly realized when I was in college was that I knew absolutely nothing about the history of the borderlands, certainly nothing about the history of Mexico or the history of the contributions of Mexicans and other uh, Latino people uh, in the United States. And so 
history provided me that entry point, that way to go in and to begin to learn and to be to be able to talk about um, uh, this history. Um, and I knew when I started my graduate studies at the University of Houston that I was going to write on the Mennonites. I grew up in the Mennonite church. My dad uh, was a Mennonite pastor, um, you know, for for uh, for many years. Um, and to be able to get to graduate school and to have uh, a history program there that was very strong in Chicano and Latino studies, uh, to be able to say, uh, we have no idea what you mean by these Latino Mennonites, but, uh, you know, we're going to help you out and we'll be supportive as much as uh, as much as we can. Um, I, I, I want to talk specifically uh, about the stories of Latinos who joined the Mennonite Church during the middle part of the 20th century. And I'm only going to give you sort of a slice of, of the book. The first part of the book deals a lot with kind of the missionary uh, history, uh, but the, the, the real thrust of the book is in the civil rights era and the civil rights movement. It really is a social movement book through and through. Um, those who joined the civil rights movement and were part of uh, the, the Mennonite church or what was known then as the old uh, Mennonite church um, joined out of an outgrowth of their faith, the ideas, the theology uh, of peace that was greatly influencing and, and people that were greatly influenced by theologies of peace, uh, non-resistance, uh, protesting the Vietnam War, all of these things that came together in the 1960s in a very, very powerful way. Latinos and Latinas that joined the Mennonite Church did so out of the efforts uh, of Mennonite missionaries who in the 1930s set out to evangelize Latino communities in places like Chicago, in South Texas, and later in Puerto Rico and New York City. And let me see if I can, oh, does that change? Is it the arrow key here for, oh, wait a minute. I gotta hit that. Okay, there we go. Um, this is one of the, the one of my four more favorite photographs. One of the things that I did in terms of trying to sort of understand the, the missionary outreach that went to Mexican households. This is a picture that was taken in a small town in South Texas uh, called Mathis, Texas, about an hour and a half, two hours south of San Antonio. Um, in and this would have been around the 1940s or so. Um, but one of the things that um, you know was really sort of significant was not only. Uh, for Mennonites was not only Bible teaching and so forth, but it was also um, the establishment of vacation Bible schools. It was the establishment of uh, even uh, teachers that were working within the public school system and even allowing Mexican kids who were um, deeply marginalized within the, the public school system and actually kept back because of their accent or because they were Mexican for two or three years. And so you had kids that were Eight, year, eight or nine or 10 years old, even just barely leaving uh, kindergarten. And Mennonites, part of that educational mission that they had was to help students um, get to more advanced grades a lot, uh, a lot faster. And of course, if you can imagine in the South Texas heat, if you've got folks that are knocking on the door saying, we've got Kool-Aid and cookies, uh, you have every mother in the neighborhood saying, take these kids away from me, right? And so that's exactly what they did uh, in many instances. This is also another one of the, uh, my favorite photos in, in Mathis, Texas, I think really sort of bucking against the trend that Mexican American parents were not supportive of their kids getting an education right. Look at all the parents uh, proud uh, of their kids as they were presenting and participating uh, in part of a program there uh, at that time. And so one of the things that's really important to understand is that Mennonite missions did have a, a deeply evangelical thrust, there was that sort of teaching of the Bible and salvation and getting people to church and to uh, commit their lives to Jesus Christ. But there was also a strong social service message uh, that went along with that. And in every one of the areas that they went to uh, in South Texas or in barrios uh, or ghettos in Chicago and in New York City, they, it would have been areas that would have been deeply uh, affected by um, uh, you know, poverty, low wages, families just eking to get by, and also heavily populated by new immigrant uh, populations. So during the middle part of the 20th century, the Midwest was a region characterized by missionary flows southward and labor flows northward. Places like the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, for example, served as an important training ground for evangelical missionaries destined for urban centers in the US or places such as Latin America, Asia, and Africa. 
For Mennonites in particular, the Central Mission Agency, the Mennonite Board of Missions and Charities was in Elkhart, Indiana. And in the 1950s, uh, the, the, mission, the Missions and Charities uh, organization launched its greatest uh, missionary efforts to Latino families uh, in Chicago's West Side and in the cotton fields of South Texas. Out of those missionary efforts uh, emerged preachers, emerged church leaders, emerged Sunday school leaders, worship leaders, but also organizers, also radicals, feminists, activists, people that took their politics very, very seriously. So I'll quickly cover this history and push us to think more critically about the relationship between religion and radical and reformist politics. And in a multiple, multitude sorts of ways, thinking about how civil rights politics and activism also served as a larger project of community formation, of placemaking for Latino migrants who were making the Midwest their new home. In the cases that I document in the book, the quest for civil rights included building inter-ethnic alliances between Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans. And in 1968, as a matter of fact, they organized uh, this group here, the Minority Ministries Council, and, and these guys, and they were all guys, uh, took up much of the energy uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the book. And as you can see from here, uh, a good mix of African-American men that were Latino men, and of course, Lawrence Hart, if anybody recognizes the Native American Mennonite leader, uh, Lawrence Hart, uh, there to the, to the left there. And while these movements, for the most part, uh, were dominated by men, Las Hermanas also created uh, spaces uh, by organizing their own conferences that brought women together, Latinas, that brought them together from across the country. These conferences are still happening. They're still organizing this, these conferences. And what is remarkable about them is that they were not receiving uh, funds from Mennonite church agencies. Women were raising the funds on their own to get to these conferences. They were selling tamales, they were making plates, and they were fundraising to get women out of the home and to get them into a space where they could support each other. It was really, really phenomenal. So a lot of the, the activity that they had led to an unprecedented rise of Latinos within the Mennonite church in a span of about 10 years from about the early 1970s to the 1980s. Latinos went from zero representation on national Mennonite church boards to having them on every major church board across the denomination in the East Coast and in the Midwest. So there's three things that I want you all to remember. There won't be a quiz, but I do want you to remember these three things in terms of being able to encapsulate all of this. The first is that Latino religious activism that emerges out of these church conferences and out of the group of men that you saw there earlier was a reformist project. It was not a revolutionary project. It was not a sense of radicalism that emerged out of there. They were reformists. They believed in the church. They believed in the sanctity of the church and the power of the church to reform people's lives and to reform society as well. It was always gendered. Uh, very much so in terms of the kind of male leadership that emerged at that time. And women, Las Hermanas, that, that begin to do their own conferences, really following the lead of Mexican-American and Puerto Rican feminists that were also pushing back against the patriarchy and machismo within their own particular movements. Not simply telling men or demanding men that they fit in and belong, but simply saying, if you won't have us, we will create our own movements and do our own thing uh, to fight for the causes that we believe in. Um, the last thing is that it created possibilities for inter-ethnic coalitions. And this is one of the things that really, really sort of uh, drew me in uh, right at the beginning. The coalition with African-Americans uh, and to a lesser extent, Native Americans through what came to be called the Minority Ministry Council had a profound effect on the trajectory of Latino religious activism. The surge of the Latino religious activism that started as an effort to get more Latinos into church leadership, what really begins as a sort of this pool of like, we need to get more Latinos into Mennonite church leadership, evolves into a movement that found strength in coalitions between groups of color and in its gendered hopes for redefining Mennonite identity so that the politics of belonging were not simply about fighting to belong to a white denomination, but also fighting to sort of fit in and understand each other and where they were coming from across uh, differences of race and ethnicity. Doing so, of course, raises important questions about race, cultural identity, and gender. 
in a context where, imagine this, Mexican Americans from South Texas, cotton pickers, people that worked the land, meeting for the first time uh, a person of African descent speaking Spanish, an Afro-Puerto Rican from New York City, really sort of puts mm -hmm. up for debate what it means to be Latino, who gets to be classified as Latino, and even amongst themselves, asking themselves, well, are you Black or are you Latino? And where, not only in terms of skin color, but in terms of political loyalties. Whenever, when, whenever I would come across these sorts of documents or see this in, in, in the archives, I thought this is what is bringing me in to tell this story. This is what I really sort of believed in as being one of the more powerful moments of forming interethnic uh, coalitions. Uh, forming these coalitions with African-Americans and even uh, many progressive angles within the church turned out to be one of the key reasons why Latinas and Latinos ended up staying in the church. I always asked them, why didn't you just leave the Mennonite church if you were fighting so much, if it was so racist as you say that it was, why not just leave and go and join a Pentecostal church that might have more Latinos or go back to Catholicism and so forth. And every single time uh, the responses had to do with the relationships that they had built among themselves, but also, and maybe even to a lesser extent, um, their love and their fascination with Anabaptist peace theology. That became quite central to them. They also uh, really enjoyed uh, hanging out with this close-knit family of ethnic Mennonites, the Yoders, the Millers, the Brubakers, the Friesens, you know them, right? All of these names. Um, the Puerto Rican church leader, Jose Ortiz, who some of you might know, uh, used to say frequently, and, and he was joking, of course, but he would say that Latinos should not enter the debates among white Mennonites. He called them peleas entre primos. These are the cousins that are fighting amongst each other. Let them do their thing, and then we'll come in and join them when, when, it's, when it's our time uh, uh, to get in. In other words, it was a family fight. It has nothing to do with us as Latinos within this denomination. For Latinos looking in from the outside, the vision of white Mennonite culture in the 1960s and 1970s was racialized. Mennonites were white, they were not ethnic. It was gendered, women did not wear makeup, the men built the barns, the women baked the bread, and it was quiet. Most white Mennonites worshiped with restraint and did not enter the political arena as activists. These perceptions were a reflection of the realities of white Mennonites in the years after World War II as the lure of Americanization and identifying racially as white at home coincided with an increase in global missions. On the one hand, the mission field was a place to maintain kind of past ethnic identity. And on the other hand, the mission field turns into a place where doors are opened for a white church to view its faith tradition and to view its future within a, 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 an expanding, growing call for evangelical outreach. So a relational dynamic emerges, spurred on by how white Mennonites saw themselves in relation to other racial and ethnic minority groups in South Texas and Puerto Rico, for example, white Mennonites carried with them strong beliefs about the perceived deficiency of Mexicans and Puerto Rican culture and its need for salvation. Mennonite missionary Amza Kaufman was often the most vocal about his visions of Mexican Americans, whom he labeled as, quote, a brown race that as a class are more or less ignorant and given to vices shooting and cutting affairs. In Puerto Rico, civilian public service, and it was nice to see a nod there to, to CPS here in the, uh, the markers there of history as you enter the building. Um, in, in Puerto Rico, the civilian public service workers struggled with how to categorize the multiracial complexions of Puerto Ricans. In one report, one CPS worker noted how, quote, Puerto Rican physical features are very much like our own, except for the Negro and Indian influence. Those perceptions were not limited to white Mennonites. Of course, this was a broader discourse on race and identity in the United States, part of that larger narrative of racial exclusion that treated Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans as foreigners in a domestic sense and as second class citizens throughout much of the history of the United States. From the moment that the US colonizes Mexico in 1848 and later Puerto Rico in 1898, white supremacist thought has fueled violence and segregationist politics that have targeted the Latino community. The interesting thing within that is that the nation, the US government has always identified Latinos as uh, quote unquote white. There was only one year in the census in 1930 where Mexican was actually considered a racial category. Outside of that, they have been categorized under, uh, under whiteness and yet 
have suffered similar uh, ailments in terms of segregation and discrimination in housing, lending, and in education and so forth with a kind of de facto um, segregation that impacted uh, these communities. What one historian has called legally white and socially colored. The fact that most Latino students arrived on Mennonite campuses and these hermanas would have done this and the men that I showed you in the previous picture here, these guys right here, uh, many of them came of age uh, in the late 1950s and in the early 1960s. Some of them had the opportunity to attend Mennonite colleges, many that would have looked very much like E-Town here. Um, they arrived at Mennonite campuses just as civil rights movements had captured the attention of the nation. And that had a great effect on how they thought about faith, politics, and social engagement. Latino migrants who made their way to the Mennonite church in the 1960s and 1970s were no longer only coming from the migrant labor camps. This time they, they're moving from places like New York or South Texas and coming to Indiana, coming to the Midwest to now work in denominational offices. And in most cases, these Latinos were the same kids that had attended Mennonite vacation Bible schools in the 1950s. The Latinos who entered the church during this time established a permanent fixture in the church and blended their religious and cultural identities. They often called themselves Meno Latinos and Meno Latinas. I don't know if that's still used anywhere, but that was popular in the 1970s. Not surprisingly, the center of some of this religious identity in, in the Midwest was in Chicago. Um, and this is a great photograph, one of my favorite photographs of the Lawndale Mennonite Church Choir that by the early 1970s had attracted a large number of Mexican Americans uh, every Sunday. Here they are performing at St. Francis Cathedral in Chicago. This is considered essentially the Mexican uh, cathedral. Um, and they're here performing, I believe actually CBS was actually um, televising uh, their performance um in in uh december in the 1970s i don't have the date exactly but um the lawndale church choir became one of the first and the lawndale church became one of the first self-sustaining and bilingual latino mennonite churches in the united states the church also developed somewhat of a folk following because of this uh lawndale choir uh and this out of this lawndale choir come two phenomenal singers gracie torres uh, was Puerto Rican and grown up and raised in the Bronx, and Seferina de Leon, who grew up uh, in South Texas. And through both of them, they begin to sort of uh, participate in these um, uh, musical um, concerts and per, you know, uh, producing their own records and music and so forth, really as a push to bring in um, a more sort of vibrant form of worship uh, within, uh, within the Mennonite church. Uh, Gracie Torres was very much part of the hippie kind of Bob Dylan, Joan Baez kind of culture, and Seferina de Leon was much more about musica ranchera, Mexican, traditional Mexican um, music. Um, so the height, the kind of the height of, of this movement and some of the, the, the one of the most important uh, events that took place was um, the Cross-Cultural Youth Convention uh, in 1972 in uh, Indiana. This was a really significant event because the Minority Ministries Council organized this event and they stipulated in that event that no white youth were to be invited. And if white youth were going to be invited, they had the power to select which white youth could come, right? This was a, a, a conference and a convention strictly for Native American, Asian American, and Latino and African American um, youth. And it, was, it came, came out quite successful. There was uh, a large grouping uh, of youth that came in from all over the country to Epworth Forest, um, Indiana, to come and celebrate and get to know each other. The beauty of this is that the um, people had uh, the idea, the great idea, to audio record the sermons, to audio record the worship. And so you can walk into the archives um, in uh, Elkhart, Indiana, into the MCUSA denominational archives, and have a listen to the entire uh, conference in 1972, including all of the worship music and so forth. Um, the movement was very influential, uh, very much uh, alive around them, even though they were within the church and within sort of the smaller grouping in the Mennonite church, uh, taking everything that was going on within the movement. And even as you see the young woman 
uh, with a sombrero, with a mariachi sombrero, and then a Puerto Rican uh, t-shirt. The idea was that if you were of Puerto Rican ancestry, if you were Puerto Rican, then you would wear something of another cultural group uh, that was Latino or another cultural group represented there um, at the at the convention. And if you were Mexican, then you would wear a Puerto Rico t-shirt, right, to show that kind of solidarity um, for each other. There's so many wonderful uh, photographs. As a matter of fact, um, the, the photographs that are taken sort of really capture the spirit of these young people during the height of uh, the civil rights era in the early 1970s and, and really sort of capture what they were sort of dreaming about and fighting for. And again, over and over in these sermons, when you hear about belonging and when you hear about fitting into the Mennonite church, it didn't necessarily revolve or hinge on whether white people accepted us or not. It was more about getting to know your own history and getting to know the history of other racial and ethnic minorities. So not so much vertical as much as it was horizontal. Um, this is not what Mennonite worship looked like uh, in the 1970s. And so in terms of pushing back and really redefining what that uh, was all about, bringing in electric guitar, the drum set, uh, much uh, faster beats and rhythms, uh, and really bringing the culture into, to, uh, uh, into the space of the church in a way that uh, it had not uh, been so before. And the other is, uh, this is one of the great photos, one of the, the, um, the more sort of popular things going on during, uh, during this time were um, El Teatro Campesino that was organized by Luis Valdez out in, in Central California for the United Farm Worker Movement. And El Teatro Campesino would essentially recreate the relationships, the oppressive relationships between the growers and the workers in Central California. And so here these young people are essentially recreating that uh, on this stage and taking, taking a turn, taking, inserting themselves into, uh, into these politics. And what was different is that there's the question of faith is always sort of surrounding them, right? It's a matter of, you know, what would Jesus do, right? To sort of quote uh, a popular refrain there, what would Jesus do in that sense? The following year in 1973, Las Hermanas host their first um, conference uh, or what they ended up calling services of inspiration or servicios de inspiración. The conferences were mainly about moving women whose husbands often traveled or were involved in church work out of the home and away from the chores and childcare into a space where they could share religious experience with other women. Seferina de Leon, who you see there standing uh, in the middle of two women, uh, in an interview that I did with her told me that this was a time for women to come and where their husbands could stay at home with the children and where women could be refreshed and get to know each other. What she didn't say and what she didn't tell me until later when I showed her this photograph is that uh, the skirt that she's wearing that is representative of Mexican culture and that sort of projects a type of pride in Mexican culture is something that Seferina as a young girl in a Mennonite church would not have worn, right? To mix culture and faith in that sort of strong way was not something that she was brought up in, certainly not something that Mennonite missionaries would have been preaching or talking about. And so for her, this was a liberating moment. Uh, a simple skirt that projects her pride in her Mexican culture was central to who she was. The other is wearing makeup and being able to cut her hair and style her hair, right? And to be able to show a type of pride in her appearance and the way that she looks, which was contrary to what she learned as a little girl um, in Mennonite Sunday school classes that, you know, young women were not to wear makeup, that they were not to wear certain, you know, pieces of clothing and so forth. I found that probably one of the more fascinating parts of uh, of, of writing this book. You go from an era in the 1950s where there are all these rules and regulations about the body and what you can put on the body and how you express pride in your culture. And by the 1960s, that starts to go by the wayside. And by the way, it's not only people of color within the church, right? It's also a lot of white Mennonites that are opposing the war in Vietnam and that are letting go of some of the strictures that they themselves, young white Mennonites themselves, had grown up um, within, uh, within the church. This first conference takes place in April 14th in 1973. Close to 60 Latinas gathered at Iglesia Evangelica Menonita 
In Moline, Illinois, women came from as far away as Texas and New York and as close as Indiana and Chicago to that Quad Cities region. And according to Maria Bustos, one of the conference organizers, the women gathered because there was a need to get to know each other and to worship God. And this is really important to worship God in Spanish, as she said. I'm going to fast forward to that one instead. This is a, one of the pictures of you can just see how full they got with the women that attended uh, and that came out. For a lot of these women, this was the first time that they were traveling on their own or with a group. It's the first time that they're leaving the home and the sense of empowerment that they were able to leave with from these conferences uh, was quite, quite significant. The politics of it all and how it works out in relation to the politics of feminism around this time, I don't, won't get too much into that. We can get into that in the Q&A, but I write an entire chapter of how they themselves were dealing with the questions of Latina feminism uh, in particular. The conference is significant because prior to this meeting in Moline, um, Latinas had also rarely held any positions of leadership within the church and for the most part had remained behind the scenes, even as women attended uh, minority ministries councils uh, meetings, they were often the ones to cook the meals, they prepared the coffee, uh, they made sure that everything was was prepared for the men who were going to gather and do the quote unquote work of the time. Women continued to organize more and more conferences. I love their themes. One of the themes that they had was La Mujer Decidida en un Ambiente Hostil, a confident woman in a hostile environment. Another thing was Embajadoras de Cristo, Ambassadors of Christ. And another is Libertad y Responsabilidad en la Familia Cristiana, Liberty and Responsibility in the Christian Family. It's another thing that I sort of write about in the book too. Maria Snyder, who was a Puerto Rican woman, she was a nurse, trained as a nurse. She was one of the first in Latino Mennonite periodicals to write about birth control, to write about going and, and seeking out therapy, to write about or empowering women to talk about the abuse that they might be facing at home with their husbands, um, that it was okay to ask for help in taking care of children and so forth. And if any of you ever met Maria Snyder, you can totally see it. She was rambunctious. She did not take it from anybody or from any corner. And she made sure that women had an outlet to talk about reproductive health, public health, just in general, right? Questions that for the most part, Latinas, questions and conversations that for the most part, Latinas were not having, and especially not having uh, in the church. They did, what, what these conferences did also was not only prove that Latinas could be effective church leaders, I don't think anybody had any doubt about that. This was already understood as Latinas were often, even though they were not given positions in the church, they were often regarded as gifted preachers, Bible interpreters, singers, and musicians. What these conferences did more than anything, uh, and this comes from just in talking uh, and interviewing many of these women that were part of these early conferences in the 70s, uh, was that it shatters this universal notion of Latino and black male leadership and exposes the workings of sexism within the church, which often came through most clearly in the ways in which that Latinas and black women were um, often laughed off or not taken seriously when they demanded to take on stronger leadership roles within the church. I'm gonna go back to a picture that I showed you a little bit earlier. As you can see in the kind of lower left uh, there, uh, Seferina, or she goes by Sefi, middle name, or the, her nickname, Sefi de Leon signed it for me. This is an album cover uh, for one of the albums that they produced, that her and Gracie produced in the 1970s. And it's got all the hits it's very sort of 70s vibe-ish, right? But it's got worship music in there. Uh, it's got uh, musica ranchera, Mexican traditional uh, ranch music, uh, and also kind of the, the Bob Dylan, Joan Baez vibe that, that Gracie Torres, who was from the Bronx, was very, very much uh, a part of. They produced two albums uh, at that time, and those albums as well are also now kept at the, uh, at the archives and are, I, I believe, have been digitized, or at least I hope they have. Um, but I think in terms of kind of the cultural production of Latino Mennonites, African American Mennonites also had uh, some of these uh, music albums and so forth. I think it says something about the kind of production that they put in, the kind of contributions they made to worship. Uh, I would encourage everybody to look up Austin uh, Yunke's work on the Lawndale Choir and on the kinds of contributions that 
Latinos and African Americans made to Mennonite music in the way that they contributed in the 1970s. It's quite powerful. Um, let me conclude just to say that Latino Mennonites of this generation, and I want to keep Sefi and Gracie up here um, as, I, as I wrap this one up, but just to think about the fact that this was a generation that could, on a, on, on a, uh, on a dime, could preach John 316 and could shout Chicano power. This was something that went hand in hand uh, with them. Um, the, the activism of the Minority Ministries Council in the 1970s, we see that Mennonite identity and Mennonite activism have not always been singular, that when we talk about kind of conscientious objector status or when we talk about protesting war, there was a lot more going on during this time. And it was really fascinating to sort of try to uncover the plurality of the Mennonite experience, right? To see how different it was across region and across space. And I think the other thing that's really cool about this is that a lot of this is happening in the Midwest or most of this is happening in the Midwest. And as some scholars have said, this is a place where generally not much seems to happen in the Midwest, right? It's just fascinating to me that when we talk about inter-ethnic coalitions, black and brown coalitions, Latinos and African Americans building these these movements, Chicago is a great laboratory for it. Um, Chicago had the highest rates of Mexican and Puerto Rican populations, and so it's no surprise that they would have not only collaborated with each other, but even Cuban, Dominicans, other Latino groups that would have been around at that time, and certainly with um, African Americans uh, at that time. Um, in um, uh, it's it's and, there, and there's cases like this. Uh, all across the Midwest. And I think there's something to be said about the fact that, especially when you're in a region when you're greatly outnumbered, right? People sort of look for each other and try to find each other, right? Maybe Latino students uh, on this campus sort of get here and then they try to find each other and, and look for each other to sort of um, at least feel some sense or get a reminder of home, right? Um, that's them now. In 2017, I was able to uh, organize a reunion of all of them. Uh, you see Sefi right there in the middle, Gracie Torres is off to the left, and some of the men in that original picture that I showed you from uh, the early 1970s um, are here as well. Um, of course, they're older, and uh, it was a little bit of a challenge to get them all together, but we were at Greencroft. We were at a retirement home in Goshen, Indiana, so it helped because all of the facilities were set up for this generation. So it worked out. Uh, it worked out just fine. We had to make sure we, you know, inserted a lot of bathroom breaks. But other than that, it was uh, it was really, really a fun time. A lot of times these for many of these folks, they had not seen each other in over 25 years, over 30 years. And one of the things that we did was when they were all there and in this picture, by the way, too, before I forget, I want to mention uh, in this picture, too, is um, uh, members of the original Ventura family and the Ventura family were some of the first Mennonites that some of the first Latinos that men, uh, that converted and started to join the Mennonite mission in Chicago and eventually also um, uh, grew and developed more churches in the Denver uh, area. So it was great to have John Ventura who was there as well um, to to uh, uh, to join us very talkative group. They all had a lot to say, but we were prepared. We had recorders. We had Goshen College students that came there and video recorded and audio recorded everything that they said as they reminisced, uh, as they had lunch and as they had dinner, we invaded every part of those uh, conversations because they were doing everything uh, in terms of everything that they were doing was about a memory or about a moment or something that they uh, remembered. And there were so many of those stories that didn't get to go in the book, primarily because I wasn't able to really cooperate, right? It was just somebody's memory of what had happened, right? Um, but anyway, so many wonderful, uh, wonderful stories. So my hope is that with this, and as we think about um, uh, this history and what it means, what it means when a group is fighting for inclusion, fighting for a place at the table to belong uh, and in the process, they learn something about themselves. In the process, they figure something out about the significance of political coalitions. I hope that that lesson that these folks gave to me um, throughout my many interviews with them and then meeting them 
uh, later in life and their families came by the way to, uh, to this. I hope that it gets us to move beyond kind of vertical silos that often trap us in a kind of black and white binary, right? Or even a brown and white binary, right? And keep us from examining the intersections of black and brown people um, about our collective struggles. Too often we think about the Chicano movement and we think about the Southwest or we think about it as kind of a centrally Mexican movement. Uh, and we forget that oftentimes there were many coalitions with other racial and ethnic groups that were formed. Certainly the Puerto Rican movements, one of my favorite groups that I talk about in, in the second book project that Steve mentioned, the Young Lords, while they were a predominantly Puerto Rican group, there were Mexicans that were a part of the Young Lords in Chicago. There were Dominicans. There were people of various racial and ethnic identities that participated in these movements. And I think if we begin to sort of take a more sort of horizontal approach, we can begin to see the power of coalition building and collective struggles that were central to civil rights movement and central to even, I say more in the book, but even into the black freedom struggle. Latinos and other people of color were watching the Black Panther Party. They were slowly taking note of what Martin Luther King was doing, what Malcolm X was doing. And then in many ways, taking, taking those ideas and applying them to their community, however different uh, it might've been. That doesn't mean to imply that the Latino movement wasn't an organic movement. It most definitely was. But just to say that the power of how these groups interacted with each other to bring about the kind of change, I think is a significant discussion as the demographics of this country now today continue to change, more interracial families, uh, more sort of um, mixed income families, different demographics across the state, different parts of the country that are changing quite rapidly. I also believe um, that in, in addition to the kind of horizontal approach and a moving away from these vertical silos in looking at, at civil rights history, um, that I hope it leads us to a rethinking of liberal arts education in the 21st century. Um, we're at a moment, we all know it, in terms of the attacks on critical race theory, the attacks on talking about racism within the class, uh, within the classroom, um, you know, the, the, the conversations and debates around uh, Confederate statues, stuff that's going on on my campus around a Confederate statue that we have, uh, that we have there. And yet the discussions on race are more important than they ever have been, even as people in positions of power try to censor, um, try to censor those, those discussions. How can we make academic programs and offerings at colleges and universities more reflective of the changing demographics? I think looking at the civil rights movement, looking at the Minority Ministries Council gives us a direction, points us in a particular way. One way uh, that, that that might be, uh, that one way to develop that or to think about adequately funding academic spaces for Latinos, for African Americans, Native Americans, and Asian American students at colleges like E-Town, at my own institution, where we continue to fight uh, for ethnic studies. I think we have a tremendous opportunity to not only build on these strong programs in, in peace and conflict studies and so forth, but to talk about race, to center race in our discussions uh, about peace and conflict and to position our institutions, hopefully, as leaders in comparative studies on race and ethnicity, on class, gender, and sexuality. Why is this important? I think because it opens new pathways for academic research. Who would have ever thought that a book on Latino Mennonites would ever have been written? You know, at least that was my vision. I don't know if anybody else was surprised. I know my dissertation advisor was surprised. Uh, but I think it opens up new pathways for academic research and perhaps more importantly, moves us toward a relational approach uh, as a better way to appreciate the multiple histories and contested politics that have encompassed our religious identities, either as Mennonites or Anabaptists or people of faith in this country. Thank you all very much. And I think there's time for questions. Yes, we have time for questions, and given the microphone, uh, if you would repeat the questions, uh, that'd be helpful for those of you here. I think we have a question from Ken. You showed a 1972 picture of a choir. You called it the Langback Choir. You didn't call it the Young Ladies Choir. I couldn't identify any young men of that age. I'd be interested if they were deliberately, it was a female choir, or if they're just not attractive, men are not attracted to that. 
I have also, I'm interested in young men that age and conscientious objection. No, I was talking about the 1972. That, no. Uh, let me see if I can find it. That one. That one, okay. Uh, I also am interested in young men of that age and their attitude toward the Mennonite view of conscientious objection. Yeah, great, great question. I think this is a uh, one particular church that came up and had their choir. Um, I think if you saw like the picture of the Lawndale choir, um, the the organizer of it, I can't remember his first name, but I believe Hirschberger was the last name, uh, uh, gifted musician that was a leader of that choir and there were men a part of that choir. I think this is just one particular church group's uh, choir there. Um, in terms of consciousness, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I think, um, yeah. So that's right, I should have done that. Uh, the question was in terms of um, uh, the, the gendered makeup of this particular photo that you're watching here, were men just not interested in, in choirs at that time? And then the other question had to do with what was the reaction or the sentiment around conscientious objector status um, and the war in Vietnam as well during that time. Um, so the, the, the question of, of conscientious, conscientious objector status was a really sort of difficult one that uh, men of color, particularly Latino men, struggled with. There was a, uh, where most of these men were coming from, and especially South Texas, there is a deep military tradition, very, very strong military tradition. Um, and I think there was a sense early on amongst them that they would declare conscientious objector status, that they would uh, protest the war in Vietnam. That changes, though, as more and more of their family members and friends that they grew up with coming back in caskets uh, from, from Vietnam. That changed tremendously. There was one young man, Raul Hernandez, who started out as a, uh, started out very committed to protesting the war in Vietnam. Uh, and when a close family member dies, he leaves the service, the alternative service that he was participating in and joins the war, uh, joins the military and, and goes out and, and fights. So it, it wasn't, sort of cut and dry with this group. It was very, very different. And many of them were very, very conflicted about their commitments to it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One question that has uh, come in uh, through the Q&A. Um, was there, did you find any uh, interaction between Latino Mennonites or Mexican Mennonites and low German Mennonites in Mexico? And is there any sense in which um, Mennonites who've lived three generations in Mexico, now moving to the low German Mennonites, who've lived in Mexico for three generations, now moving to the United States. Is there any sense in which they could be defined as Latino Mennonites? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a long one. You don't want me to repeat that one, right? Okay. Um, Summarize it. Yeah, the question has to do with, with uh, Mennonites in Mexico and their interactions with low German Mennonites there in Chihuahua in the state of Chihuahua where there, there's large numbers there. Um, and now uh, many of them crossing into the United States, many low German, Jose Friesen, for example, somebody like that, right? Coming in, would they be then considered Latino Mennonites, right? Um, well, sort of to so the first part of the question, I would just direct everybody to Rebecca Jansen's uh, amazing work on Mennonites in Mexico. Um, I don't write about the Mennonites uh, there or their interactions with the Mexican population uh, there. I think the question of, you know, some of these uh, folks then migrating and where they fit in, uh, I think is a great one. I, I don't know what I, I don't know what to say to that. I would I would just say if people are continuing to self identify as such, then maybe that's enough. You know, uh, if that's where they feel like their home community is. But I don't know because I th aren't they sort of very restricted and very sort of um, kept away from sort of the broader population. So I wonder when they migrate here, I don't know, I'm just sort of wondering whether or not they stay with the kinship with the ethnic community or whether they branch out. Yes. Uh, this is an excellent historical study of um, the civil rights movement at that time. I'm curious, uh, I don't know how to ask this question because I don't think it has a simple answer, but could you give us just a little feel about the relationship today uh, between uh, Hispanic uh, 
people in the Mennonite Church, Mennonite Church USA. Mm -hmm. um, where, where do things stand today? So great question. And Mr. Crable, it's good to, to finally meet you in person. You saw this uh, uh, manuscript right from the beginning. So it's good to get to, to get to. You said it was a good one. So I said, we're going to go with it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, well, thank you for the question. The question is about the sort of bringing it to the contemporary times, right? Talking about what the relationship now between uh, Latino folks is to Mennonite Church USA and to these broader denominational uh, structures. Um, I'm not as connected as I once was to uh, Iglesia Menonita Hispana, which is the body that um, functions as sort of the leadership for uh, Latino Mennonites in the United States. Um, other than saying they have an active Facebook page and, and they're pretty active on, on uh, social media, and especially with kind of educational projects that they've had um, around um, uh, an Anabaptist seminary on the move. In other words, taking Anabaptist theology and Anabaptist ideas and going and meeting people in their churches and their community and then doing classes so that people can be trained in church leadership. Um, but I know that it's been a struggle. I, I, I don't know what the numbers are as, as much. I know Conrad Kanegi, we were just talking about this earlier, uh, who did that, that marvelous study in the early 2000s around the numbers. I don't know what, how that would compare with uh, today. I think there is a you know, really sort of significant opportunity here, um, especially with Anabaptist theology and with the positions on peace and justice um, to really appeal to a population that is not only searching for a kind of political pathway to, um, to justice, but also looking for a kind of theological home. Uh, so much of what we know and study and think about even in, in religious studies is often around conservative movements. Uh, Latino evangelicals were often blamed for higher turnout, uh, voter turnout for Trump. Um, and so I, I, you know, I don't know what to necessarily think about that, but I mean, I, I, I think that there's an opportunity here for, um, uh, for the church and the church leadership to really sort of touch on that. Now, whether they will or not, I don't know. Part of what happens here in, in the magic that I sort of, you know, just sort of got lucky enough to, to be able to tell this story is that um, this is not often the case everywhere, right? Many of Latino churches are very conservative. The people in the pews at the time that this was written would have disagreed vehemently uh, with some of the political positions uh, that they were taking. There's a moment where uh, the Minority Ministries Council organizes a conference uh, for faith leaders within the Mennonite church, and they invite a Catholic priest, uh, Patricio Flores. Now, if you're Latino and Protestant or Mennonite, you know, first and foremost, that that's a no, no, that that's just not something that happens. So there were, there was a lot of those, there were a lot of those tensions that, that happened and, and took place. Um, and I think, I think today, um, the fact that, you know, these movements are maybe not as prevalent within the Mennonite church specifically, doesn't necessarily tell us that they're more conservative. I think it just tell us, tells us that in terms of a strong organizing base, maybe there's not that kind of platform nationally that these folks could have. Um, I think there's some good opportunities, but definitely a lot of challenges uh, in, in, um, in where we stand as a nation, for sure. Another question that came in from uh, the online audience. Uh, could you speak to, or did, did your research involve uh, Latinos who may have worked as migrant workers on Mennonite farms? And uh, this person notes uh, that their connection to Lancaster County, that would have been a phenomenon in Lancaster County. Mm -hmm. um, did you look at that? Or did you look at, at um, migrant labor, Latino migrant labor on Mennonite farms in other parts of the US? So the only one, yeah, the, the, thank you for the reminder, Steve, because I was getting ready to jump right in. Um, no, the question is around, um, did I do any, any writing in the book around Latinos that had worked on Mennonite farms as migrant farm workers? Um, and um, for the most part, I didn't primarily because my focus was on um, Latinos that um, first met Mennonites in their home communities. So in South Texas or in Chicago. And many of the communities, especially in South Texas, where the Mennonites came down to do missionary work, they would have been cotton pickers up in West Texas. They would have gone up to uh, Minnesota, 
uh, probably Michigan. My own family went up to Michigan and to Archibald. Uh, but for the most part, they would not have worked on those Mennonite farms. They would have first met Mennonites at in their home communities. My family was the only family that that um, that I wrote about just briefly in, in the introduction that had worked on a Mennonite farm. And that's how really I'm here today in terms of my Mennonite background and, and connection to it. As a matter of fact, it was the uh, one of the editors at the press that suggested that I write something briefly about how it is that I got to the topic because it might be hard for some people to understand how or why Latinos would have joined the Mennonite church. And I think that was a good call. I wasn't prepared to do it. I wasn't thinking about it, but I think it, it most definitely was a good call. I hope, and, and this goes to, to the question specifically because the person mentioned um, about the experiences of people in Lancaster County uh, and working on Mennonite farms. There's so much research still yet to be done. And so when I think about history thesis projects or even dissertation projects later on, or um, you know, uh, somebody getting a graduate degree or even just needing a history thesis project at the undergraduate level, uh, I would push them and, and hopefully encourage them to look at some of these archives because there's an, uh, a lot of work still yet to be done. I think I just scratched the surface for sure. Questions? Um, the question I had, I think yeah. it's sparked by something that you just said about um, the maybe negative reaction when the Catholic priest was was invited. What is the, are there, despite that sort of overt pushback against the Catholic heritage of virtually all these folks who are the first generation are converting, did you see elements of, or, or what are the elements of, of um, uh, Latin Catholicism that that continue uh, or 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 were there not? But I, I imagine there had to be some that continue in the lives and churches of these people. Sure. Uh, the question is around the elements of, of Latino Catholicism that continue even after conversion. Um, uh, sort of rooted in that kind of comment that I made about inviting the Bishop Patricio Flores, who was the first Mexican American Catholic Bishop in the United States in 1970, and to have him present there was a great honor, certainly, but also raised a lot of red flags uh, for a lot of Latino, uh, Latino preachers. I think it's a, I, I, it's a great question, Stephen. I think primarily because I don't see the carryover being so much in kind of formal church practices. I think what you had was a kind of more sort of informal religious faith that was still transferred. So in terms of folk healers, curanderos or curanderas in the community, there was plenty of evidence of folks, even after they had come to the Mennonite church, that they were still visiting those spaces as much as Mennonite missionaries and other Protestant missionaries had, um, you know, tried to demonize uh, that kind of practice. Um, the sense of remembering the dead and remembering the ancestors and so forth, those sorts of things continue to, to, uh, um, to live on. What really breaks is this notion that theology is sort of out of, you know, um, the realm of ordinary folk, right? That somehow you need a preacher or somebody to interpret the Bible for you, right? I think that sense goes out the window and there's much more of a kind of this priesthood of all believers, right? Coming in and, and participating uh, in, these, uh, in these conversations. But I, as much as people would always tell me, I made a clean break from Catholicism to becoming Mennonite or to becoming Protestant. Um, you can oftentimes, if you hang out after church and you hear people having conversations, they're having sort of these informal conversations about, you know, my daughter being sick, the medicine isn't working, I'm going to have to take them to so and so because this isn't working right or I'm going to have to go to this person or that person. Um, I, I cite uh, and I name Amza Kaufman who's one of the Mennonite missionaries down there, he wrote uh, somewhat on this when he had a, a small sort of gathering of, of, of Mexican Americans in South Texas. Um, and right around the time that World War Two hits. And a lot of young men are being called to service or joined the war effort. Um, he notes and actually writes down that after all the work that we've done, they are simply going back to La Virgen de Guadalupe to pray to her for their sons as they leave. You know, I think those things are are part and part part of not just kind of religious belief, but also a kind of cultural belief that's really, really sort of central to being Mexican and to being Latino uh, in a lot of cases. And so. It's hard to let some of those things go for sure. And I think there's a good blending of that. I often, I often would tell people, um, 
you know, at our, our church in Brownsville, our Mennonite church uh, was very Pentecostal in terms of its worship style and, and its prayer and its kind of lively uh, worship. Uh, but we were also, in a sense, very mainline protestant ish you know, in the sense that we had hymns and stand and sing hymns. Um, and the only, the only way that I could describe to my friends what it meant to be Mennonite in South Texas is that we were a lot like the Baptists, but we didn't believe in war. And that was the one thing I could just say and just keep it simple like that. So, yeah. But I think, the, I, I think religious conversion, con, conversion is just sort of one part, but it doesn't necessarily, it, there's, it's very rare, I think, to find kind of that clean break uh, from, from the kind of strong ideas of Catholicism or even notions of Pentecostalism and so forth. You had mentioned briefly that some of the instruction was in Spanish. Yes. Uh, how important was it to preserve the Koifuna in that way, to actually have Spanish instruction in the uh, camps or the church? Yeah, so the question is around Spanish instruction and how important it was to hold services or even educational things in, in Spanish to maintain culture or la cultura, right? Um, it's, 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 it's a great question. I appreciate it because one of the things that begins to happen, a lot of these young people that get to Mennonite church leadership, some of the men that you saw in that picture, um, English would have been their primary language. Um, they would have spoken it, they would have learned it in school, all of that. It's when the movement begins to take over. It's when what it means to be Chicano in the United States is to speak Spanish and that gets tied in. Their meetings change to Spanish. Everything goes back to kind of that original language. It's actually Las Hermanas that um, hold everything in Spanish. The men were doing English and maybe a mixing in of Spanish and so forth, but it's the women that are doing from beginning to end, the entire service is in Spanish. It was fundamentally important. Um, I think it's it's very similar to what the, sort of the best way to describe it is how um, the theologian Justo Gonzalez talks about it, where that reading the Bible in Spanish is not simply reading the Bible in Spanish, right? That there's a deeper um, connection that's cultural, that's spiritual, uh, that translates in a very different way, right? When when people sing in Spanish or when they read the Bible in Spanish and so forth, but everything begins to go and get translated into Spanish. And so it affects even, I, I, I found it really interesting because the documents, all of a sudden the documents in the archive where I was doing the research go from English to predominantly Spanish. And it only lasts for about two or three years and then it goes back to English, but um, it, was, it was certainly very, very important. Yeah, around that time. And what did that shift from English to Spanish do to the, how did that affect the um, the interethnic coalition going? I mean, then how, how does that affect the having a meeting with African American folks who speak only English? Yeah. So the question is around how did that then affect the intercultural and the coalition building with African Americans or other people of color that would not have spoken uh, Spanish at the time? Well, I think there's a there's a component there too where. Um, uh, African American leaders like Hubert Brown, who wrote the book Black and Mennonite, like John Powell, who was very active uh, around that time, uh, are talking about a return to Africa, a return to the roots. And they are pushing the denomination to send black missionaries to Africa. If you're gonna send missionaries, do not send white missionaries, send black missionaries. So there's also not just sort of a racial ideology sort of developing or racial politics developing, there's a deep seated kind of cultural an ethnic tie with African Americans that are seeking their connections to uh, to their roots. Latinos are paying attention to that, and I think there's kind of a mutual respect with the two uh, in terms of Latinos speaking Spanish and providing translation uh, for folks that don't speak English, or making a meeting where if uh, you know if there were monolingual English speakers, then uh, then maybe the, perhaps the meeting could be held in English. But it was a constant conversation because Latinos were also sort of saying, well. Um, if you're going to send African American missionaries to Africa, then only send Latino missionaries to Latin America. And of course, that doesn't necessarily go over as well, right, for a lot of folks, especially because to speak Spanish in Chicago is very different than to speak Spanish in Colombia or Puerto Rico or different parts of Latin America. There's just different words that you wouldn't say. My dad uh, told me the story of how many times as a Mexican American, my father would get in trouble because he would say things that in another 
region of Latin America was a curse word or was something that didn't translate very well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, all, all to say that they were very aware of, of those politics and were very careful to make sure that, um, you know, that, that even as they were, you know, taking Spanish seriously and so forth, that they would also um, keep it open for, for the other groups, for African-Americans and so forth. Um, I'll say one more thing on language. Uh, Spanish uh, becomes even more important in the 1980s and in the 1990s with a huge influx of Latin American Mennonite leadership that rises to kind of power at this time. Uh, so rather than having Chicano or Puerto Rican church leadership like they did in the 60s and 70s, by the 80s or 90s, it becomes much more Latin American, much more Colombian, uh, Guatemaltecos, different people from different parts of uh, Latin America, and it takes on a different sort of meaning. And the Spanish is very different. The Spanish is much more formal. Uh, some of the leadership that was coming from Latin America was academically trained, so they spoke a more sort of academic Spanish. Uh, a lot of the preachers that you saw in the picture there um, had maybe a year of college or maybe no college at all. And so it was all kind of learning on the fly and certainly their Spanish would not have been considered academic Spanish. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic. I'm hoping somebody takes up the, the, the challenge of writing part two to this book because uh, I ended at 1982. So I'm hoping somebody will take it from there. We'll see what happens. Yeah. So that it was kept for their contributions to the Mennonite culture, or was the Mennonite Church uh, hosting these in a way to kind of bridge the two, the American white culture with that people? Yeah, great question. So talking about um, uh, the recording these events, sort of taking them down, making sure that that that. Um, uh, that somebody is taking note of what is happening, right? And you're asking, uh, was it the white Mennonites that were doing this or was it out of their own initiative, right? If I'm understanding correctly, uh, it was completely out of their own initiative. Um, I think one of the things that happens is they were not simply invested or interested in meeting with white Mennonite church leaders uh, over budgeting or whatever it may be. They were very interested in just meeting with each other and this is why they restricted which white students could come uh, to this conference. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, white students that was invited and that came uh, to this particular conference was there at the reunion in 2017 when I brought them all together. Um, but, but everything, the recording, the audio recording that took place there, the kind of documents that they saved and the archives that they saved was all out of their own doing. And, the denomination was helping in the sense that they provided logistical support for them. So booking of the campground, right, to host a conference or, you know, maybe providing some funds for people to travel or whatever it is. But all of the planning was in their hands and the initiative to record everything and to do the real to real recordings of, of everything that was going on at this time um, was really them. It was all that it was all they're doing. When I first got to the archives, there were just stacks of the reel to reels, this big old machine. And, you know, I had to have the archivist help me install it because I had no, no idea how to do it. Uh, they've since been digitized, um, which is great. But um, I really, you really sort of begin to appreciate and respect the folks that were there, but also saying, I think something really magical is happening here. We should probably turn on the recorder if we can, right? Or if we've got some way to do it, let's do it. And then to save it. And then years later, not immediately, but years later, bring it to the library and bring it to the archives and turn it in. Um, and I was able to do a little bit of that recovery work. Um, when I would interview people, they would bring me their photo albums and show me all of the photographs that they had from those days. And I was able to scan some of those and upload uh, those there. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, the historian Vicky Ruiz calls um, religious archives um, really, uh, points of departure, like gold mines, really, like places where you find things that oftentimes uh, people might overlook. Um, I mentioned Jose Ortiz a little bit earlier. He was a Mennonite pastor for many years. He said that uh, Mennonite missionaries, and maybe they taught them this, but Mennonite missionaries had status because they had eyeglasses and they had cameras 
and everywhere they went, they had cameras. And so maybe they sort of learned it from them, right? Watching these missionaries constantly take photos and constantly record everything that when they come around and they do it, this was all of their doing. Yeah, and I, and I think we're all set to benefit for that for sure. Okay, I'll ask one more question. Because yeah. You're here. This is, uh, <laughs> so in, um, in another book in the Young Center series, Daily Demonstrators on African-American Mennonites, there's yeah. a chapter about the significant role that, um, that intermarriage play, interracial marriage played in the African-American uh, Mennonite story. Is there a similar phenomenon of significance of of um, Latinx and Anglo um, marriages or not necessarily? I mean, it, it's a thing, but like, is it, was it significant in the story? It wasn't significant, but it was a thing. And there were several marriages and, and one in particular um, that uh, really sort of caused um, a lot of concern uh, for Mennonite missionaries. You have to understand that in the in the rule books for voluntary service or for before young people went off and did this, Young women especially were um, encouraged and even probably mandated to stay away from young men. You know, they're sort of the limits that were placed on, on, uh, on young women. And I'm not saying that was specific to the Mexican or Puerto Rican population, but whenever you have that population, it becomes a racial dynamic almost immediately, right? Um, but it wasn't as significant in terms of what's going on in, in Daily Demonstrators and in Tobin's uh, uh, book uh, in terms of writing. There simply just weren't enough. And the ones that were there, the, the marriages that did happen, didn't stick around to fight or do anything. They left the church uh, completely. As a matter of fact, one of them was a daughter and the name evades me now, but it's in the book. One of them was a daughter of Graeber, one of the first uh, leaders. Yeah, J.D. Graber. Yeah, I believe so, if I'm not mistaken. And his daughter, his advice was, you know, perhaps you should move to Argentina and live there because there you won't face the kind of criticism that you might face here. Um, and I don't think they left to Argentina, but they certainly didn't stay within the Mennonite church. So I think their choice was to leave it just entirely. Yeah. Thank you all so much. These were great questions. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight and sticking it out with, uh, with us uh, this evening to kick off Hispanic Heritage Month here at the Thank you. Thank you to the Young Center. Thank you, Steve. Well, uh, thank you again, uh, Felipe, for being with us this evening. And before we close this evening, I'd just like to announce um, uh, remind you of a couple of our, our upcoming events in about three weeks on Wednesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. Uh, you can join us here at the Young Center for an in-person discussion with Elizabethtown sociology professor Conrad Kanegi to discuss his new book, A Church Dismantled, A Kingdom Restored. The discussion will be at 4 p.m. It will not be live streamed, but uh, you're warmly invited to gather here with masks and distancing to hear from Dr. Kanegi and to discuss his book. That's at 4 p.m on Wednesday, October 13th. And then on Saturday, October 16th, as part of Elizabethtown's homecoming weekend, stop by here at the Young Center, the grounds around the Young Center uh, from noon to 4 p.m. as the Brethren Heritage Festival returns. We'll be back with food and crafts, music and a family magic show, Saturday, October 16th from uh, noon to four. And then a little over a month from now, for those of you joining us uh, remotely, uh, another uh, in-person but also live-streamed event, uh, Thursday, October 21 at 7 p.m. Uh, join us uh, again here or virtually uh, for our annual Brown Book Award lecture. Dr. John Eicher from Penn State uh, Altoona will be speaking on migration stories and Mennonites on the move, Russia, Canada, Germany, and Paraguay, based on his recent book, Exiled Among Nations, German Mennonite Mythologies in a Transnational Age. And again, that event will be live streamed for those of you at a distance. Special thanks this evening uh, to our support staff from um, ITS uh, who made this program possible. And thanks to Elizabethtown College for its support of the Young Center. Good evening and uh, safe travels as you return home. And the first in-person event, so done. Wow.